July afternoon. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Max Haven. I am one of the co-directors of the Radical Imagination Project. And we, along with the Nova Scotia Public Interest Research Group, are very pleased to welcome you here uh, to talk about Anthony's article uh, today. Um, I guess I always uh, start by acknowledging the fact that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq land and that uh, we're thankful that our Mi'kmaq hosts have allowed us to stay here and enjoy this beautiful uh, province and this beautiful day on this beautiful province. Um, before I get into you know today's event, I just want to give you a brief overview of where it fits in our programming. Some of you may, may be familiar with the Radical Imagination Project. For the last four years, we've been doing a series of research uh, sort of participatory research initiatives here in town with social movements. And over the last couple of years, we've really focused on organizing events, hosting speakers, uh, and supporting other people who are putting on events that help enliven or enrich the radical imagination in this city. Uh, and we're starting something a little new starting this summer. And in fact, this event is the first in a series. We really want to highlight the sorts of radical, theoretical, intellectual, and strategic thinking that's going on in our city. Uh, we've done a lot of work of bringing people in, uh, really inspiring speakers, but we think there's an incredible amount of talent here that we need to uh, help broadcast and highlight, and actually begin to have, or continue to have really, a series of very important debates around key questions that are facing <coughs> the left, that are facing humanity, that are facing our world right now. And so today's event, we're very pleased to have a sort of inauguration of this next series that we're doing in the Radical Imagination Project, uh, focusing today on uh, electoral politics. The title we gave to the talk was uh, Beyond the Trap of Electoral Politics, a uh, talk that will end a discussion that will focus uh, largely on the <coughs> Democratic Party uh, and its potentials or lack of potentials in our current political juncture. So stay tuned for future events in this series. If you'd like to approach us about working with us to uh, put on an event that will highlight a local speaker or a local thinker, we'd be very interested in hearing about it. The next event that we're going to be part of organizing uh, is on July 30th. We are just confirmed at the company house at 7 o'clock. It will be a fundraiser for the group that is going to the People's Social Forum uh, in Ottawa. Uh, and it will feature a panel of speakers talking about um, what the potentials are for a social forum, what the good and the bad is, uh, and what we need to sort of think about as we move towards the social forum. So that should be an exciting event. Uh, you can see more about that on our website, which is radicalimagination.org. Um, yeah, I think that's all the updates I have about that. Uh, it's great to see so many people here on a beautiful day. Um, I guess without much further ado, I'll, I'll introduce Anthony. Uh, some of you may have read his piece, uh, which was posted in two parts to the Halifax Media Co-op website a month and a half ago, two months ago? So, it's anonymous. April. April. <laughs> Time flies. Uh, initiating movements towards socialism in Canada, uh, which those of you who've read it or are familiar with it is a very um, closely argued, very systematic uh, discussion of why the NDP cannot meet the needs of the left, let alone the radical left, at this, at this moment. And a very uh, cogent argument, I think, for why strategy at this moment needs to be about <coughs> abandoning the hope that the NDP will somehow gain electoral success and solve all our problems, especially in the face of the NDP's multiple failures over the last couple of decades to do anything remotely like that. Um, so the format that we, we sort of arrived at today is Anthony will have uh, maybe 20 minutes to half an hour to sort of discuss, uh, summarize, or expand upon his uh, ideas. Uh, and then uh, I'll sort of maybe ask him a couple of questions, but we'll sort of see how it goes and take it a little more organically, because I'm sure many of you have opinions and questions and comments that you want to share. And the hope is that we can have an organic, uh, fruitful discussion that you know, probably we're not all going to be on the same page. We're not going to all be of the same mind, but hopefully we can have a good, a good discussion that moves the discussion or the debate along a little bit. Uh, as always, we ask that everyone remain 
respectful and uh, hospitable to one another's ideas and opinions, that we can have a good, uh, a good discussion, and that we can somehow all leave here stronger in our, in our resilience and our capacity to make change in our deeply screwed up world. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Max. Max has said that at the outside, I have 30 minutes. And those of you who've, who've looked at my essay, Initiating Movement Towards Socialism Online, will know that it runs to quite a few pages, and it's, it's only one installment in a series of papers that I've written over the past year. So uh, I'm going to do my best to encapsulate my thoughts in uh, a manner that will make some sense, but inevitably I'm going to have to skip over certain points, and hopefully if there seem to be any big gaps, we can address those during the question period. So the first question that comes to mind is, why have I spent so much time and energy on discussing electoralism? Uh, the first thing I would say is that I believe that the world is entering into a grave and potentially terminal social and environmental crisis, and that electoralism is not only not going to help us to deal with those conditions, but is in fact counterproductive. I'll, I'll come to that later, explain why I think that in fact it's not just that it won't get us anywhere, but that it will move us backwards. So why do I say that elections in the current conjuncture are futile? Well, the first point to examine is simply the record of failure. I think that after a, a, a broken series of extending over 30 years and across virtually all countries in the world, where we've seen time after time that neoliberal regimes are elected regardless, or perhaps what I should say is that the politicians that are elected, regardless of what they might say beforehand when they're on the stump, actually rule as liberal, neoliberals once they're in office. It seems to me that in the face of a pattern like that, that is so ubiquitous over both time and geography, that the onus should actually be on right-thinking leftists to tell us why elections do matter, rather than on me to say why they don't. But I don't think it's good enough to leave it at that. One question that obviously comes to mind is, it doesn't seem that it was always this way. <coughs> There clearly was a period in Canada, for instance, and indeed most of the industrialized democracies, where it was possible to elect a party that would enact some kind of progressive reforms. So the question is, why would it be any different now? The answer is, to my mind, that the anomaly was actually that period. Um, historians often refer to the years 1945 to 1975 roughly speaking, as the four distant era. And um, it's the period, of course, during which the welfare state reached its apogee, and um, there was advance on a lot of fronts. The thing is that we have to understand that the conditions of that period were not typical. We often seem to act as if we think that, well, OK, for 30 years, things were like that. Granted, it's been more than 30 years since then, and things haven't been like that. But it's almost as if people keep expecting that it's going to revert to the way it was during the Fordist era. But if one considers the uh, geopolitical dynamics, it should be obvious that wouldn't be the case. The reason why the Fordist era was such a special epoch during which it was possible for there to be popular progress through electoral means was that, of course, the Cold War was on. And socialism was a very real alternative if not necessarily in Canada. Certainly, Canada and the other industrialized democracies had a vested interest in proving that their system under capitalism could still be progressive as a way of persuading people in third world countries that they should come down on the US side or at least remain neutral during the Cold War. There was, in fact, as well, some possibility to times within even the industrialized democracies that uh, there could have been a change over to socialism. But 
in general, of course, that all collapsed with the end of the Cold War. And even before that, there had been other kinds of changes taking place, particularly uh, the advent of neoliberal globalization, which allowed corporations to become much more footloose, meant that the population of uh, various countries found it more difficult to get trench, uh, to get any any sort of hold on the politicians, because and now I guess I'll move over into a discussion of some of the mechanics, because fundamentally it's true that if politicians do move past a certain point in uh, in acceding to the wishes of the population and trying to look out for the concerns of ordinary citizens as opposed to what the capitalists want, then capital can go on strike, capital can pick up and move and go somewhere else, and <coughs> politicians don't want to be left holding that bag. There are other uh, structural dynamics that evolved, some coterminous with the period that I was talking about before this era, some that have developed over the, the time that neoliberalism has become ascendant. Um, again, I, I won't have time this afternoon to go into all of these, but uh, I'll mention a couple. So, uh, one would be what I describe as the cartel effect. In mainstream economics, it's a recognized principle that when four or fewer, fir four or fewer firms control 50% or greater share in a given market, they're able to call for what are called monopoly prices. In other words, the, um, the price that they can demand for their goods will be higher than it would be under conditions of competition. And what is remarkable about this situation is that it's in the interests of all of the members of the cartel not to compete on the very basis that is considered the sine qua non of capitalism, which is competition on price. Because what would happen if one of them tried to undersell the others is very likely one or more of them would end up being driven out of business. And at the very least, the result would be that the new equilibrium level of prices would end up being lower. Now, the way that mainstream economics deals with this is they say, well, you know, yeah, that can happen temporarily, but what will always occur is that there'll be a new entrant in the market that'll come in and say, well, you know, I've got nothing to lose. I'll set my prices lower than the big guys. Like so much in neoclassical economics, the reality is rather different from the predictions of theory, but I'll, I'll leave that for another day. There's, another, there's an analogous mechanism at work in politics, though. You see the cartel effect there, in that in almost all industrialized democracies, even those with proportional representation, but particularly those like Canada that use the first-past-the-post system, of the game, where what happens is uh, a very small number of, of parties, often as few as two as in the United States, or say three or four in Canada, uh, will be ascendant, and, and basically no other party gets a look in. And what tends to happen it, it mirrors the, the cartel effect that we see in economics, which is that it actually becomes rational for those parties not to compete with each other based on what, in a truly competitive situation, would be the natural means of competition, which is to say what um, conservatives would call bribing voters. In other words, making promises to the electorate in general, and then obviously to some extent keeping them or people are out to turn against these politicians, as opposed to just uh, announcing policies that uh, are pretty wildly unpopular. That might seem a strange, it might seem strange that people would do that, but actually this is exactly what we observe over and over again in practice. Um, we've had Schroeder's Social Democrats in Germany, uh, Gordon Brown, the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, the, uh, the Congress Party in India under Ben Mohan Singh, the, the Party Quebec Law under Pauline Barbois. What you see is that politicians will not, to save their skins, start preaching against neoliberalism. Why not? Well, because fundamentally, at least for the upper echelons of the political elite, what they're looking for now is less to get elected and more to come to the favorable attention of, of, uh, of capital. Consider, when Bill Clinton was president of the United States, he earned $250,000 per annum. 
he makes a million dollars for every speaking engagement. Tony Blair, who is probably the most vilified public figure in, in the United Kingdom right now, demands $500,000 per speaking engagement, right? I could go on and on. We know what happens to politicians when they leave office, right? They become uh, very highly paid consultants, like Paul Martin. Uh, he came to power through a palace coup and never won an election. And now he's on, you know, he's in demand on the international circuit as an advisor on public finances. So politicians aren't going to mess their own mess by interfering with that. And even if occasionally some of them might tend to have inclinations that way, the overall impetus of their parties will make sure that they're brought back to their senses. Another reason that I think that it's futile or at any rate mistaken to, uh, for the left to participate in elections is that the party that we see as our main or perhaps only choice, the New Democrats have now strayed so far from any values that leftists would recognize as their own that I, I think we're, we're contradicting ourselves if we do. Um, in particular, I'm not going to reproach the, the NDP because they're fans of capital. Uh, for one thing, obviously the institution uh, the dynamics of our system make it such that it would be impossible for a political party not to be in favor of capitalism, to just be a non-starter. Secondly, although I personally think capitalism is the root of all evil, there are people, obviously, of, of goodwill and intelligence who think otherwise. On the other hand, so the point being that it's not self-contradictory, I think, for the NDP to take a pro-capitalist stance, even if it's not what I would want them to do. However, there is a way in which, more recently, they've very clearly contradicted their most fundamental values, and that is their accommodations with fascism. If you think about, I mean, what is, what is characteristic of fascism? How about limitless surveillance, arbitrary detention, execution without trial? And the, the, the NDP is either silent on or actually approves of all these things. What am I talking about? Limitless surveillance, obviously the five eyes signal intelligence agencies that monitor all communications across the world. Arbitrary detention, well, uh, Guantanamo Bay, anyone? Canada's security certificate program. Uh, how about uh, execution without trial? In February of last year, the, uh, the uh, Barack Obama administration released a pricey of a white paper in which the president asserted his right kill anyone he wanted to, anywhere in the world, just based on his finding that this is, uh, that, that this person is, uh, is adverse to U.S. interests. And uh, since then, the uh, president has maintained that somehow this is in, this is in keeping with the due process that is called for under the U.S. Constitution. But how it differs from uh, arbitrary murder, I, I personally can't see. Even more recently, uh, <coughs> since the coup in Ukraine uh, a couple of months ago, what's happened is that, uh, well, there have since been elections, but the interim regime that, uh, that uh, took over after Viktor Yanukovych was, was chased out of the country comprised uh, elements ranging from the merely xenophobic, like the Fatherland Party, to outright neo-Nazis, such as Svoboda in the right sector. And what was the NDP's response to this? Thomas Mulcair threw a conniption because Stephen Harper refused to take him on a state-sponsored trip to go ahead and shake hands with these people. What's more, Mulcair fell over himself in his attempts to stir up trouble in Ukraine. Uh, what he did was, of course, uh, essentially uh, egg on the regime to take uh, strong countermeasures against the pro-Russian elements within the country. And this, in turn, brought with it the very real risk that uh, Russia would find the necessary to intervene militarily. If that had happened, and of course it could still happen because the conflict is still raging there, then obviously NATO would step in and 
and we would have the Third World War. So you've got a situation where uh, Thomas Mulcair, basically, in order to make nice with Bay Street and ultimately with Washington, is willing to flirt with the possibility of a nuclear conflict. I found that when I present all these arguments to people, a lot of them will say, well, you know, all that's true. You know, the sure thing, you know, the, the NDP, they're, they're a rotten bunch and they're not getting any better, but we have to vote for them anyway. Why do they say that? Well, uh, years ago, Margaret Thatcher, uh, one of the original neoliberals, made popular an expression, there is no alternative for the acronym TINA. That's what right-thinking leftists want us to believe. They, they say there is no alternative to the ballot box. And that being the case, who are you going to vote for? The NDP, obviously. Well, I'd like to introduce a new initialism, TISA. There is so an alternative. <laughs> right? uh, and I, I, I'm going to set that aside for the moment and, and talk about what I see this alternative <coughs> being more substantially. But first, what I would point out is that earlier I, I mentioned how there's this basically unbroken pattern across the world over the past 30 years of, of neoliberals being, or for all parties that come to power, ruling as neoliberals. Well, the one significant exception to that is certain countries in Latin America. And you can see a similar pattern in all of them particularly those that have been most radical in their movements, such as Bolivia, uh, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And that is that in, in all of these countries, there was an established electoral left right, that often even subtracted a significant, uh, uh, significant voting bloc. But like in the rest of the world, they were consistently neoliberals once they got into office. So what happened is um, beginning in the late 1990s and, and continuing for a period of several years, um, you began to see popular uprisings. Like in, in Bolivia, they had what were called the water and gas wars, where uh, there were there were the state privatized utilities, and the people resisted this. They they simply refused to accept it, and they didn't do so by saying, "Oh, you know, we're going to vote you out of office," or you know, or even we're going to create a, a new political party that's going to do what I say. No, it is so direct action. And the reason that it worked is because um, it, it changed the equation, it changed the balance of power. The reason why politicians can consistently, uh, or, or the, well, yeah, essentially the reason why politicians consistently ignore the electorate is because, well, what else are we going to do? Right? You know, who else are we going to vote for? Uh, even again, if we said, well, shoot, you know, we'll have to create a new political party and, and you know, those folks will do what we want. Well, of course they won't, because they'll be subject to the same systemic dynamics that have led to the corruption of the NDP and everybody else, right? So instead, what has to happen is there's got to be actual disruption of the system. It can't be a matter of saying, okay, you know, we'll, we'll threaten to not vote for you. They don't care if we don't vote for them, right? And again, the only, the only feasible way to cause this disruption is through mass action. And ironically, that actually can be the basis for electoral activity, ultimately, as, as happened in Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Right? What, what happened was that after mass movements had sufficiently changed the equation, had changed the balance of power of the country, so capital had to say, whoa, you know, these, these folks are serious. They're, they're actually physically preventing us from doing what we want to do. Then that actually created the space for uh, the creation of new political instruments that um, have, at least to some extent, certainly much more than you know, we see in Canada, have, have ruled in a, in a progressive fashion. And part of the reason, well, there's been, of course, an enormous uh, counter-revolution on the part of Washington. We're seeing this in Venezuela right now. And again, the only reason why Maduro is able to, to to stay in office is because of the changes that Chavez made that led uh, to the democratization of the state at a very deep level, where instead of 
relying on institutional mechanisms that have operated from the top. Chavez set up the neighborhood uh, councils and various other features that allowed the people to continue to have a direct voice in, in how the country was run. And it's, it's that kind of deep democracy that has so far allowed Maduro to fight back against Washington, although I'm not necessarily that optimistic about what's going to ultimately happen there. So obviously, we can't just summon up these mass movements. We you know, can't come on. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna, tomorrow, we're going we're gonna to storm the Bastille. It doesn't work like that. Um, so <coughs> the question is, well, all right, what, what do we do in the meantime? Is there anything that we can do that makes some sense and that maybe will actually conduce towards that sort of mass movement? And in initiating movement towards socialism in Canada, I argue that, indeed, there are such methods, and I refer to them as constructive and obstructive resistance. Um, again, considering the time, I, I can't really go into any examples now, although you know, we could certainly discuss that question period. But what I can try to do is give you some sense of the dynamics of this, this type of resistance what I'm talking about. So the first, the first, well, actually, before anything else, I should preface this by saying you know, if, if you're hoping that I have some great new idea for a tactic that nobody's thought of, I have to disappoint you. That's not what I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> as Ecclesiastes said, there's nothing new under the sun. That's not it. Rather, what I think makes this idea of constructive and obstructive resistance uh, different is, is the approach that is being taken, not the specific activities that are being carried out. As it were, the uh, the how and the why rather than the what, I guess. So the first point is that it needs to be principled. In other words, it won't do to just come up with an idea for an action and say, well, you know, that seems kind of like a nice thing to do, or, you know, vaguely it, it would make the world a better place. I think it's important for us to think about, well, okay, how can we actually do things that are really consistent with our principles rather than just, you know, kind of, sort of, maybe, and part of the way to ensure that is to keep in mind what Marx called praxis. And that's intentional, reflective action that takes as its object, changing both ourselves and the world, because both are necessary for revolution. Right? We, won't, uh, we won't have a revolution if that doesn't happen. Or if we did, we wouldn't be the kind of people that could carry it out successfully, or certainly even more so that could uh, successfully institute socialism after. This kind of resistance is premised on the idea of solving problems directly rather than appealing to Big Brother. So again, it's not a matter of trying to you know, get the attention of the media or uh, you know, ultimately of government and say, you know, we want you, you, you folks to do this. Although, I mean, in an aside, I should mention that I think that kind of activity is generally not terribly effective because most of it comes back to, uh, you know, like if you hold a demo, what's the point? You're trying to trying to make the politicians think like we're tough, we're you know, we're standing up to you, we're out of office. But we've already seen that's a ridiculous threat because we can vote this bunch of neoliberals out of office, and this bunch of neoliberals will come in to take their place. Right? So. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm not actually saying that we have to completely forget about all that. In, in arguing against taking part in elections, in other words, I'm not saying that we necessarily have to give up entirely on trying to um, influence politicians. The point is, it doesn't matter who you elect. It's what kind of pressure you put on them, whoever they are, once they are elected. But as I said, my preference would be for us to just say, like, Screw the bunch of them. Who needs it? Let's figure out ourselves what we need to do, whether it's, you know, we have to stop the bad guys from doing something, like fracking, or whether it's that we say, like, okay, what, what do people need? Well, they need food, so, okay, let's have a community garden. Um, and another feature that I think is really important is that this kind of resistance needs to be 
as much as possible. I mean, again, all of this is talking about aspirations, about ideals, and I'm saying that you know, if a particular activity doesn't meet all of these criteria, strictly, screw it. You know, it's not good at all. But certainly, ideally, I think that this kind of activity should be based in uh, organic as opposed to intentional communities. And so, what I mean by that is, I don't think uh, th there's a danger in our activism that we segregate ourselves from the mainstream population. Right? And um, I, I don't think, apart from anything else, I just don't think that's effective. Um, part of the reason why not is that the, the bad guys are always going to win the propaganda wars because they have vastly greater resources than we do. But the funny thing is, I, I think that at root, most people actually share what I would describe as socialist values. They just don't realize that's what they are, right? Because they're, they're being fed this, this line from mainstream media all the time. And the only way they can find out is if we enact those socialist values, right? We can't talk about them, we can't preach it. That's not gonna work. We don't have the resources. There's no way we, we can possibly uh, overcome the, the propaganda efforts of the right. But what we can do is we can, we can show people in everyday life what this actually means. And I think when people see that in action, they'll say, well, shoot, that's not so bad, actually. I'm all for that. I think that this form of activity has a lot to recommend. Uh, it, it can yield quick and positive results, you know, as opposed to elections where, uh, you know, first of all, they, they, you know, they take a while, and then it takes a while to see what the politicians are going to do. and then get disappointed anyway. And that gets pretty depressing after a while. So it's nice to think about a way of approaching political activity such that we could actually hope to see some real progress, even if it's only on a small local scale. Another point is that, and this, this kind of relates to the, what I was saying about the organic communities, is it becomes a pattern of life. It's not just an occasional disruption of our lives the way that elections are. It's under our control. We're not, we're not hoping, doing what we can to elect these other people and then hoping that they're going to, you know, hoping foolishly, that they're going to do what we want. And it prepares, and, it prepares both us and the conditions that are needed for the revolution. At least, you know, at the very least, as I said, in the Bolivarian stuff, that is to say, it, it you know, can lead towards, <laughs> ironically enough, a revival, presumably, of electoral activity at some point if the ground is shifted sufficiently. But again, it's really important to understand that the mass movements have to come first. It's no good founding a new party now and saying, you know, this is going to, you know, they're going to be rigorous. They're going to you know, instantiate our ideals. They won't because it's got, it's got nothing to do with the people in these parties. It's the system, it's dynamics. And they'll, you know, they'll affect the, the new party just as they just in exactly the same way they do the NDP. So another question that might come to mind is, well, why not do this, you know, why not combine this with electoralism? Well, as I said before, I think that it's a big, electoralism is a big waste of time and effort. Especially unions waste enormous amounts of time and money and energy on elections that could be better spent in other ways. But I think it's actually worse than that. I don't think it's just that we put in a lot of effort and don't get much back. I think that it's, in fact, counterproductive. In the recent elections to the European Parliament, the, uh, the radical left made some gains, but the radical right made much greater gains and are now the largest faction. What united these two groups? They were the ones that were Eurosceptics. They were the ones that were opposing the European Union. Why did the parties of the far right have more success than the parties of the far left? Well, I would say a couple of reasons. One is that um, voters have seen for decades that various parties of the left come forward and talk good game and then betray them in office. So I think part of it is a lot of people have simply been turned off anyone who classifies herself as a socialist or what have you because of this historical experience. The other thing is, I think 
Well, remember I, I mentioned Tina before, there is no alternative. So if right-thinking leftists say, well, there's no alternative to supporting the NDP, it doesn't matter how evil they are, because you know, at least they're not as evil as Stephen Harper or whatever. Why should not voters say, well, you know, this is, this is not a, a meaningful choice? What, what that claims is, you know, what it really comes down to is these right-thinking leftists are acknowledging that capital's power is so great that it's only to be expected that the NDP will continuously shift to the right in order to um, you know, be competitive with the other parties in the eyes of capital. So voters are quite reasonably entitled to draw the conclusion, well, okay, if you guys are effectively saying there's no way to stand up to capital, well, okay, then, then let's admit that and let's back these parties to the far right that generally do say, okay, we're not going to interfere with the prerogatives of capital because that's too strong a target. Instead, we're going to pick on weaklings like you know immigrants or you know whoever it might be. And even morally, if right-thinking leftists are saying, well, you know, it's it's a shame that the NDP are in bed with the fascists, but you know what are you going to do, right? They have least the evil. Well, again, like how can we reproach voters for throwing in their lot with xenophobes and you know other types of bigots if Effectively, that's what we're doing too, right? We're, we're supporting an institution that has signed off on fascism because we're saying, well, you know, geez, it's, it's the best we can do. There's nothing else to do. So, what has happened is that because of the betrayals of the left over a long period of time, people have not only been turned off the institutional left, but they've been, again, as, as I was just explaining, they've been turned off the very idea that it's possible to have a world in which we actually try to look out for each other. Instead, it becomes so peepoo, you know? You gotta look after yourself because there's, there's no way you can beat the big guys. I'm gonna conclude, um, well, so, uh, you know, in a, a, what I wanna say here is <coughs> it's important to me that we reject the NDP on moral grounds, right? I mean, for the practical reason that I just said, that I think that if we don't, then what we're doing is effectively telling the population that um, there's, there's no such thing as uh, genuinely decent politics. But I think there's another reason, which is that we destroy ourselves as moral beings if we don't do that. This is a um, story by Ursula K. Le Guin called The Ones Who Walk, walk Away From Omelas, is that right, Emma? I've heard it said Omelas, yeah. Um, it's, well, it's not really a story. It's a description of this imaginary place, Omelas. And um, Omelas is, is this wonderful place. There's no pollution, no war, no crime. Everybody is, is happy and content. The, the wonderful cultural attainments. The, the weather is even nice all the time, for God's sake. Right? Well, actually not quite everybody is happy. There's this one little kid who's locked away in a broom closet somewhere. And in some strange, mysterious way that is never really described, um, everything in Omelas is dependent on this kid. If that kid isn't suffering, Omelas ceases to exist. Right? Everybody's life will be wrecked. Now, as some of you will know, Ursula K. Le Guin is an anarchist. And in a lot of her work, various types of, or struggle against various types of oppression is a central theme. But nobody, nobody tries to help this kid out in Omelas. Nobody, nobody tries to rescue her or persuade the population that like, this is evil. Why are we exploiting this, this child? And the reason is that there's this strange compact that literally, if anything is done whatsoever to try to ameliorate this kid's sufferings, that that's it, deal off. All of almost just totally collapses. Even the weather will turn bad, apparently. And so it's, it's a conundrum. I think the point, as I take it, is that there actually is no good answer in a situation like that. I mean, obviously, it's monstrous that this civilization is dependent on the sufferings of the child. But on the other hand, 
is it really the right thing to destroy everybody else's happiness? And it also, it's, it's clear from the story that it's not even obvious that the child will, will be happy if this happens. But as the title, The Ones Who Walk Away From Almost, suggests, there are some people who do come up with an answer. And that is that they leave and they never come back. And I think, uh, I, I take it that this story is in some ways uh, a parable for life under capitalism, where just as in almost whatever we have, we have because of the sufferings of others. And if, if it were truly like homeless, then uh, our only option would be to walk away. But there's somewhere beyond homeless. There's, there's nothing that's outside capitalism. So what that would mean, actually, is we would have to renounce life itself. Fortunately, I think Le Guin is, is too accomplished an artist to have made a simple allegory. And our world is not exactly like homeless. We, thank God, have the option of saying not in our name and resisting. But through electoralism, we're not we're not taking that option. Instead, what we're doing is we're saying, you know, for our own selfish ends, out of fear, or for whatever reason, we're saying, well, yeah, I'm going to be complicit with this. I'm actually going to positively <coughs> affirm the evil that these characters are doing, simply because I think you know, something else could, could be gained uh, by doing this, or that, that less would be lost than if I, if I didn't do this. But again, fortunately, we don't have to do that. As I've explained by talking about constructive and instructive resistance, we do have ways of trying to change the world without having to make ourselves complicit with what's going on. And in conclusion, um, I would say that being a socialist is kind of like being a farmer. So uh, we can't have socialism as if there isn't a massive popular uprising, at least not socialism as I understand it. And that's not something that we can engender through our <coughs> own individual actions. It, it happens or it doesn't. And it's kind of like farming in the sense that um, uh, a farmer is dependent on rain. If it doesn't come, then she's not going to have a crop. Right? I mean, maybe she could irrigate, but the irrigation itself won't work if ultimately if there's rain. On the other hand, if the farmer doesn't till the soil and plant her seeds and you know weed and do all that kind of stuff, then even if the rains come, it's not going to help her one bit. Right? So similarly, what I'm suggesting is that we can't engender revolution ourselves. We can't bring on this uh, kind of mass movement that I've argued is necessary even to have a Bolivarian style revolution, never mind to have a really full-throated revolution that would take us from capitalism into socialism. But what we can do is take actions right now that help prepare both ourselves and the world against that possibility, that is, you know, if that opportunity doesn't present itself. And also, in the meantime, by acting in this way, it allows us to remain whole in an emotional, psychological, spiritual sense. Thank you. That was great. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, we'll open it up for questions in a second, because um, I'm sure there's lots of questions and lots of comments. Uh, I guess I would, I would start that off by posing to you the question that I think a lot of people who would think similarly but would, would for instance, suggest to do support the NDP would perhaps, perhaps love it, which is that, um, you know, uh, in a moment when we're struggling against neoliberalism, when it's so ascendant, the election of an NDP government, let's say in Nova Scotia, would be a, objectively better for the working class, in the sense that they, yes, they'll implement neoliberalism, but they'll implement 
a slightly kinder version of neo neoliberalism. And that's going to be good. So for instance, they're not going to slash social assistance rates as much as the conservatives might, or they're not going to uh, attack union rights as much as liberals did, uh, in fact. Um, and B, so there's sort of the argument that A, if the NDP gets elected, of course it's not going to make some sort of large change. But, and let me just say I don't agree with these perspectives. I'm just, I'm just sort of uh, ventriloquizing them. So A, <laughs> I don't, honestly, I don't agree with them. <laughs> um, uh, and so the first argument is that sort of um, the NDP is not going to be as bad, and that is, makes a real difference in people's lives, especially the most impacted by neoliberalism. That you know, if the enemy gets in, they won't be quite as nasty as the others, and that's me. So that's argument A. And argument B is that the NDP in power offers more room for the radical left to maneuver because <coughs> they offer, uh, you know, they at least keep the discourse of social justice somehow alive. Uh, this is the argument that uh, you know because the NDP is in power and they allegedly have some commitment to some notion of equality, some notion of environmental sustainability, that, uh, and because uh, the radical left in that circumstance won't constantly be fighting quite as uphill a battle, that therefore it will put the radical left in a stronger position to make arguments to the general public about why something even more radical than NDP would be necessary. How would you respond to those two? Uh, those two sorts of challenges. I think I would say, make essentially the same response in both cases, which is that in the first place, why on earth would we think that the NDP are going to do any better? In the recent Ontario provincial election, uh, the Liberals ran to the left of the NDP. Um, historically, in office, it's, it's not clear that the NDP has actually been uh, significantly different. In fact, as I point out in the city movement towards socialism, the NDP is often comes under greater pressure to not pass progressive legislation because it has to prove to Bay Street that it's credible. Right? Whereas every now and again, conservatives or liberals can have these little flights of fancy where they decide to go against what seem to be capital's interests because Ultimately, the plutocrats know, hey, they're our boys, we, we can trust them. So, you know, one thinks of, uh, for example, the expropriation of Abitibi Bowater in Newfoundland a couple of years ago. Only a conservative premier could have gotten away with doing that if, if the NDP had, I mean, they wouldn't have even dreamed of doing it, but if they had, they, you know, they would have been hung from the, the, uh, the highest posts, right? Because it would, the, the, the establishment would say, you guys are unreliable. Right? So that's the first point. It's just actually I, I find it kind of amazing how proponents or uh, you know the, the right wing uh, sorry the right thinking leftists feel that they can just beg the question. They they can just take it for granted that the NDP are going to be better <laughs> at least in some particulars. Well, you know I don't I don't accept their begging of the question. I want to see the proof because it doesn't seem to me that the historical record reflects that. And I don't think it could for the reasons that I said when I was talking about structural dynamics earlier. Basically, the way it works is that capital has several parties that it can, it can choose from, right, as, as it, it finds necessary. Whereas organized labor, which is the only institutional backer of the NDP, has only the NDP. So what happens is that there's constant pressure on the NDP to curry favor with capital because it's in competition for capital's favors with the conservatives and the liberals. Whereas the NDP is the only game in town for the labor movement, and therefore, if the NDP moves to the left, the labor movement just has to kind of suck it up. But I wouldn't leave it at that. What I would say is that, well, if people are disadvantaged, if people have problems, if they have challenges, and let's deal with those. Let's think about how we can make people's lives better directly instead of relying on this nonsense of saying, oh, well, we'll let the NDP in you know, kind of hope that they'll do what we want. Or even, as I said, for that matter, 
you know, put pressure on governments if you like. Right? I, I don't recommend that as a particularly effective way to uh, participate in political struggle. But in fact, there's no contradiction. You can say, well, I'm not going to play, play this mugs game of elections, right? Worry about who's going to get elected. But what I am going to do is, you know, I'm going to hold their feet to the fire once they are elected. And then uh, something else that needs to be considered is if we had, well, as, as Evo Morales once said at one of the World Social Forums, I don't believe it is given to us to speak in terms of centuries. I don't know that it's given to us to speak in terms of decades. I think that we're, we're facing a, a potentially fatal ecological crisis that I think will begin to manifest its, well, I mean, it's already manifesting its effects. But I think we'll begin to uh, have extremely uh, strong effects within the next 10 or 20 years at most. I mean, we know this now, right? Like, uh, you've got methane that is starting to bubble up from the, the bottom of the Arctic Sea, right? Methane that has been permanently frozen for 60 million years, and, and now it's starting to escape into the atmosphere. Not only is that going to help contribute to a runaway greenhouse effect, but it's volatile. In other words, this stuff could blow up. Right? The West Antarctic ice sheet is now, it's now, now agreed that it's going to separate. Right? And once that happens, once you remove a flank of the ice sheet, then it means that warmer water can get in and start melting the rest of the permanently frozen Antarctic. So, you know, we're looking at a situation that it, it, you know, you can't overemphasize how dangerous our situation is. And as these effects begin to kick in over the next 10 or 20 years, um, you know, like we just had a hurricane, for God's sake, in July. You know? And what, what has that done to farmers' produce in Nova Scotia, right? Multiply that across the world. Where is our food going to come from? Right? As that becomes increasingly an issue, well, we're already seeing what the response of Washington is and its allies, right? Increased repression all over the world. So even before the ecological 